There's a light in the sky Rising in the air There's a feeling so strong It's time to light the fire Like a branch on the Yes, hello. Welcome to the House of Wellness. My name's Luke Darcy and it's great to be joined by three great people. Joe Stanley, Rachel Finch and Luke Hines. Good to catch up with you guys. How are you? Good. Morning, Good. team. <laughs> Another big show in store today, Joe. There's a lot happening in health news lately and I know you're a fan of the health benefits of deep breathing. And there's some <laughs> interesting research yeah. that's coming out of the US that backs up the benefits, Joe. It's called Inspiratory Muscle Strength Training. It's basically strength training for the muscles you breathe with. Yes, well, we're all aware of how powerful our breath is, but it's not something that you think about unless you're using it in some kind of exercise or meditation or if the worst happens and you run out of it. Mm. So it's all yes. about a five-minute technique where you inhale through a handheld device that, according to the research, lowers your blood pressure... Plus, on the treadmill, tests have shown that participants could run for longer and their heart rate and oxygen consumption was also pretty low. It reminds me, Rach, of for the great experience I had meeting Wim Hof. He's the Dutch extreme athlete who's famous for being able to withstand freezing cold temperatures. By using his breath. All about the breath. So mm. he's proving that through the breath, you can switch on your nervous system and control your body in a way that we thought was impossible before. Amazing. Incredible. Amazing. Control your mind and body. I don't think a day goes by where I don't use breathing techniques to really help control my life. Mm. I know that it helps my when I feel anxious, stressed, oh, overwhelmed. Whenever I feel that feeling of feeling flustered, mm. I know that I can straight away come to the breath. It's amazing what happens with the body when we are being mindful, being present. And the great thing is, it doesn't cost anything. I can do it in my trackies on the couch with my top. <laughs> oh, no, but the best thing, you can take it anywhere. I, anytime I'm stopped at a red light, I'll, that's my trigger to go, yeah, let's check in with my breath and breathing. really allow it to calm me. Because you're right, Rach, it just... We're all in, I think, that state of mind chatter mm. and it's a way of just re returning to your present moment. And if you can teach your kids that too, it really is a powerful skill for them to learn to calm themselves because kids get so uptight about mm. something tiny mm. things sometimes if you can teach them early on breathing feel that in and out it's just you know it reminds you that you are here right now and that's all that matters that well, you are present yeah. very well said joe we're staying with the breath today with a focus on the lungs thousands of people are diagnosed with lung cancer each year and because there are no symptoms during early stages it is very difficult to detect joe it's also a part of our bodies that we rarely pay attention to because do you think about getting your lungs checked out There's a part of your body you really should pay more attention to. It's your lungs. Men, women, the young and old. Visit lungfoundation.com.au such a powerful message there, the way that people, you know, have to really be aware of your breath and how your health of your lungs are. Because when you think about lung health, the first thing you think about is smoking. Not that all lung cancers are caused by smoking, but a big percentage are these days. And you know what? There's really no excuse to be unaware of the risks of smoking. There isn't. Mm -hmm. And it is getting harder, which is, I think, a really positive thing. I mean, there's very um, confronting messages on the packaging. A lot of places are banning it now. We're seeing, you know, initiatives like World No Tobacco Day. So it's, it's a really positive thing. Mm. And I think what's really exciting is that we're seeing such a shift, especially in young people. I think it's halved since about 1995, which is incredible stuff. Mm. Yeah, it's had an impact, but thousands of people are still diagnosed with lung cancer, cancer each year, Joe. which is why a group of very progressive doctors are doing their bit to change that with a lung cancer screening trial. It's being held Australia-wide, and already it is saving lives. Have yeah. your head on the pillows and feet down towards the bottom end of the table, please. Sure, no problem. 77-year-old yeah, David May smoked for 42 there. years. He comes from the era when smoking was the norm. Everyone smoked. It was fashionable. And um, nobody saw a problem with it. And so I was surrounded from an early age with um, secondary smoke. Do you have any questions before we start? David came from a family of smokers 
And even though he gave up 18 years ago, his family history prompted him to take action. My mother, who smoked right up until she literally was diagnosed with lung cancer in 1995, so she died of lung cancer. And, and I guess that sort of woke me up a little bit to the fact that it could be me one day. We're looking at people who are at risk of lung cancer, and that means they've got a current or former smoking history. And hold your breath. And we're looking for the older population as well. So we're looking for people above the age of 55 and below the age of 80, and who are otherwise you know, generally healthy. Dr Henry Marshall is part of an early detection lung cancer trial. 2,000 participants are being recruited all over Australia as part of a larger international trial. With most cancers, if you pick them up at an early stage, when it's small and hasn't spread, that's your best chance of getting a cure. So, Angela, here's your, here's your chest, starting at the top and then working all the way down through past the heart. Spleen, when I was about 13 years old, my best friend at the time, Kerry, her mother smoked Alpine cigarettes and both Kerry and I just loved Alpine cigarettes. Your arms above your head, mm -hmm. nice and straight back at the elbows. 55-year-old Angela May smoked 30 cigarettes a day. She gave up six years ago. I actually enjoyed smoking, so I didn't really want to give up, to be honest with you. And then I decided that when I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs without, you know, huffing and puffing, I decided it was probably time to stop. Angela had no idea that her father David was taking part in the trial too. After I stopped laughing for five minutes, I said, so was I. <laughs> Fortunately for both David and Angela, their results are all clear. We've had already several people who've been diagnosed with early stage cancer who have had curative surgery. We've had at least one participant with two different lung cancers picked up who successfully undergone surgery on both lungs and quit smoking into the bargain. And many other people have also quit smoking because they've been really thinking about their health um, and it's given them, I guess, an opportunity to really work hard on quitting. I don't really have any friends who smoke anymore, I don't think. A couple of people at work vape. Um, that's about it, I think. Definitely I would advise anybody who, who had the opportunity to, to, to get tested. And at the May household, there's definitely one item that's now obsolete. Except we don't bring the ashtrays out. No. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't seen an ashtray in years. <laughs> You know, that is true. You don't really see ashtrays where you go yeah, anymore. No. Remember in the old days people would smoke on planes? Oh, They would so smoke bad. in offices. And my <laughs> husband reckons he remembers a teacher in the 80s smoking in the classroom. Yeah, I'm really glad they actually don't do the ashtrays anymore because they're forcing people to carry little jars with them, yes. um, which is another form of, I guess, hopefully, getting them to wake up and realise, oh, my God, I'm carrying around this stupid jar for disgusting. Doctors age. used to actually prescribe smoking for stress you know, going mm. back in the 50s and 60s. So we've come a long way. We're going to find out more about this lung cancer screening program as we meet one of the great men behind it. That's coming up after the break on The House of Wellness. Welcome back. Before the break, we revealed the groundbreaking trial happening right here in Australia aimed at detecting lung cancer. Joining us now to tell us more, Head of Lung Cancer at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, Professor Lou Irving. Lou, welcome to the House of Wellness. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, tell us, how did these trials come about? So we, we know that this new technology, CT scanning, has the accuracy to pick up early cancers. And so the trial is now looking to see whether we do more good than harm by regularly screening people who've been heavy smokers. And, you know, harm can come from screening. We can pick up things that aren't cancer. We can worry people unnecessarily. We can do extra tests that we don't need to. So the aim of this trial is to look for the benefit and make sure that it outweighs the risks. Mm. And we saw Dr Henry Marshall in Brisbane there in that story before the break. So where are it's the trial being run in Australia? Yes, in four states, in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and Perth. 
uh, and we're each recru recruiting 500 patients per wow. centre. And there's a Canadian um, centre as well. So it's a true international study. And are you looking ideally for people who have been smokers? Uh, yes. Right. So, so ideally they've smoked at least um, what we call it a 20 pack year history. So the equivalent of smoking a packet a day for a year, for 20 years, or two packets a day uh, for 10 years. That would be a 20 pack year history. Wow. Mm -hmm. Professor, can you talk us through how the trial is actually run? What happens? Yes, so there's um, people self-volunteer, although we've found that it's often a family member who uh, suggests, <laughs> and they fill out a questionnaire that relates to their cancer risk. So we're looking for the highest risk people, and that relates to their age, to the amount they've smoked, to a family history of uh, cancer, and whether they've been exposed to asbestos or other mm. Uh, carcinogenic dusts and so on. And the study involves two CT scans separated by two years. We also check their breathing capacity because we know that people who've got reduced lung capacity related to smoking mm. are more likely to also develop lung cancer. So if something is detected early, does that mean that they've got lung cancer straight away or...? So we find uh, in about 20% we find a spot and of those spots about 1 in 10 of the spots turned out to be a cancer. So for example we've screened just over 250 people at Royal Melbourne Hospital. We found six cancers, three of them were early lung cancer and mm -hmm. the, the patients have undergone successful treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, three of them were actually cancers from other areas such as breast and pancreas. Mm. So you're in year three of five for this trial. What are we hoping for at the end of this? Well, for a better understanding of the sensitivity of the CT screening, okay. a better understanding of how to identify the highest risks patients to recruit, and a better understanding of the cost versus the benefit. So we would like to see a lot of benefit for relatively low cost. And Professor, I find that, sorry Jodie, I find that really fascinating that uh, we're now actually having a bit of a discussion around screening because we're told often, mm -hmm. got to screen everything, early detection's the key, get in and have, and you can often be sent off to multiple screenings. So you're saying, hey, let's get some research and make sure that the benefit outweighs the risk because there are some risks attached. Absolutely. And, uh, and those risks include unnecessary extra procedures if there are little spots that turn out to be something nothing. They include the psychological trauma of worrying about something that's not there. Um, and they also um, involve the risk of the radiation itself from the CT, although uh, it's relatively low radiation. Mm. So you are calling for smokers, and I have to say that um, I'm a former smoker, socially, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I, I have a huge amount of compassion for people who still smoke because we assume that you can just give up, and it's not easy. It's very hard to give up, and some people can't. Is there a stigma associated with these people, and are they perhaps not so willing to come forward to volunteer for the study? So th the answer is yes. Mm. A and interestingly, on the basis of the current data in America screening is now funded nationally, but they're actually having trouble recruiting people, probably for the reason that you've indicated, that people who are smoking feel that they've got a self-inflicted condition mm. and they feel that their life isn't worth it compared to other people. Well, that breaks my heart. What do you say to those people to encourage them to, you know, perhaps not beat themselves up so much like that? Yeah, and, and I think positive reinforcement. Uh, I think acknowledging that nicotine is a highly addictive substance that some people are more addicted than others mm. and that there are ways of quitting. Uh, there are established techniques for doing that. And we know that if people really want to stop, if they keep trying, they're highly likely to quit like you did. Yeah. Professor Lou, you're the person I want to come and see if I'm in trouble. You've got a nice calming yeah, voice. Yeah, yeah. I just feel relaxed uh, <laughs> automatically. Congratulations <laughs> for the amazing work you and your team are doing and uh, more strength you are. Thank you. Professor Lou joining us uh, with a big study happening around Australia. After the break, the fight to scratch out one very persistent itch. That's next on The House of Wellness. Today's simple and spectacular dessert is pure old-fashioned comfort. But my maple syrup custard with berry compote is also very good for you. It contains a swag of powerful antioxidants and important minerals. Let's start with the compote, heating the berries with water and maple syrup in a small saucepan. 
A dash of antioxidant-rich Viagland organic acai and berry powder brings supercharged berries into the mix and helps protect your cells from the damaging effect of free radicals. While the compote slowly cooks, we'll start on the custard by whisking six eggs with full cream milk and then adding the seeds of a vanilla bean and half a cup of maple syrup. Pour into ramekins and bake in a bain-marie until set. Serve warm with the luscious berry compote and cherish a moment of magical indulgence with this delicious and nutritious dessert. Welcome back. Now, Rach, a question for you. What would you guess would be the most common disease amongst Aussies? I would have thought it would be some sort of cancer or some sort of heart disease. That would make sense. Remarkably, it's eczema. That's itchy, dry skin. It's a condition that affects one in three Aussies, so Heinz. Wow. Amazing. Mate, that's right. And it actually can flare up and disappear for no apparent reason. And for sufferers like Carol, who we met this week, it can have a major impact on their quality of life. Went to the bank one day, came back from the bank, and I had these little bumps on the back of my arm. Carol Hall had no idea what was causing an incessant itch. So I really started scratching it, and it just started spreading to the point where the whole back of my arm was just this big red rash and almost swollen in a way. Carol had chronic eczema. Woke up the next morning, all over my stomach. And so it just continued to move all over my body. Carol visited doctors and specialists, but was stuck in a scratch and itch cycle that lasted for years. It feels like somebody's pricking you with a hundred little pins all over, so it's a painful itch. And you scratch and you scratch and you scratch, and as you scratch, it just gets worse. The result of all the scratching is you start breaking the skin. So now you start infecting the skin. Every part of Carol's body was covered, even her face. She was so badly affected that she suffered both physically and mentally. Obviously, you can imagine it affected my marriage <laughs> without even realising it because my husband was not allowed to come near me, don't touch me, don't show any affection because I'm so sore, I'm so itchy, I'm so uncomfortable. So, you know, it affected our, our relationship as well. So mentally, I think people don't realise it. It does affect you and just how bad it can be. As debilitating as eczema is, it can be managed. Every morning, I take my medication, my probiotics, my coenzymes, my vitamin. I do that every single morning. Um, my showering routine is very simple. I keep it basic. I don't add any funny products. I use a very light lotion on my skin, and that's it. I don't do anything else. I don't try new things, and it just seems to work. These days, Carol has her eczema under control. There's a lot of people out there that have it, and there's a lot of solutions. You've just got to tailor your solution to suit your lifestyle, and that's basically what I've done. Cheryl, we saw how debilitating eczema can be and how it can take over someone's life. I'm imagining that you've seen many cases like that. Look, eczema is one of those things that um, if you have to live with it, it's one of the most distressing and debilitating things. If you're a mum with kids, um, you just feel incredibly guilty. Uh, but we know this, although there's no cure for eczema, there's really good management. So we just have to look at um, options, how you can manage your own eczema. It's no hard and fast rule. What suits one person won't suit another. Can you tell us what causes it or what appears to trigger it? We know there's a genetic component. Uh -huh. So um, unfortunately, if you have eczema, asthma or hay fever in your family, your children is um, likely to get it. Um, if there's one parent, 50%, uh, two parents, 80%. Mm. Uh, also too, it can be a trigger to an, um, something you're allergic to. So there's the two facets, but normally there is a genetic component. What kind of external triggers could there be? Look, external triggers are things such as dust, pollens, you know, some sort of nickels, even products that you use every day like soaps and um, perfumes and those type of things that are in common everyday cleansers, moisturisers, even things around the house. Everything has the potential to cause your skin to flare up. 
How do people engage with their own health in this way? How can you help them? Well, look, the first thing we advise is go and see a dermatologist. Mm. They study the skin for five years, they're the experts. They will put you on the right treatment course. But for your day-to-day -day management, it's great to get in touch with us at the Eczema Association. We can really give you some good tips on daily management, what to look out for, and, and just reassure you that even though currently there's no cure, there's really good management. So using products that don't have perfumes, dyes... No more, soaps. No soaps whatsoever. Mm. So they dry out the skin, that's mm -hmm. why, and upping your moisturiser. Also drinking lots of water, looking after your health in general. It's just finding what works for you. And I've heard of colloidal oatmeal. What's that? Colloidal oatmeal is a wonderful product in nature. It uh, has a natural anti-inflammatory action. And when it's put into a product, such as a um, skin cream or a wash, it can actually help to attract moisture to the skin and retain that moisture barrier. Well, it's not often a fully-fledged association attaches itself to a product and the Eczema Association of Australasia has a strong association with Dermavine. Why is that? We've been, um, you know, friends, I suppose you'd mm -hmm. say, with Dermavine for many years, been um, part of their testing process, and it is one of the products we say to people, this is a good choice if you have eczema. We like to steer people towards um, products that are good for sensitive skin from babies right through to adults mm. and Dermavine's one of those and there's many others. Welcome back. We often joke about having a bad hair day, but the issue of hair loss is no laughing matter if it's happening to you. And the thing is, it's not just something that happens to men, Heinze. Look, it's absolutely devastating for anybody to lose their hair, and for women, it can be a real slight on their female selves. About one third of women experience hair loss at some time in their lives, from hair thinning, to bald spots. It's something that's not often talked about. Here to help us break that taboo is dermatologist Shamala Gunathesan, best name ever. <laughs> Lovely to have you, Shamala. Welcome. How Thank you. we talk a lot about men losing their hair, but very rarely about women losing their hair. Is that because there's a stigma associated with it? Absolutely. I think women we feel embarrassed talking about it. We also think it's probably normal to lose a bit of hair as we age, but we're just unaware that we can actually do something about it. So what causes hair loss in women and is it different for what causes hair loss in men? Well, the majority of hair loss really is the same pathology or the same findings we find in men. We are genetically predisposed as we get older um, and then with the combination of androgens, the male hormones, that will cause the hair loss if you're predisposed to it. At what, what age can women start experiencing hair loss? To be honest, you know, from puberty to perimenopausal times to postmenopausal. So it really happens after puberty. It's fair game for you to lose a bit of hair. How common is it for women to go completely bald? That is uncommon. So we tend to thin over the crown. Our part gets a bit wider over time. We never get fully bald, thankfully, but it's still devastating. Absolutely, because I feel like women associate our identity so much with our hair. Absolutely. And to lose hair loss, are we feeling like we're losing a part of our womanhood? Particularly if it's coming with menopause. Absolutely. You know, you think it's bad enough having to deal with wrinkles or saggy skin and then to lose hair. It's, it's, it can be devastating. OK, so what can be done? What can we do about it? Well, the first thing is to be aware of it. Research has shown that women, we tend to underestimate how much we lose. And we put it down to, oh, it's just a bit of stress or it's a weather change or the hormonal kind of fluctuation. So firstly, be aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're losing more than 100 hairs a day for at least three to six months, see your dermatologist. Mm. Because essentially now we've got treatment to treat it. We use tablets that can actually arrest the hair loss. There are over-the-counter products mm -hmm. like minoxidil, which comes as a foam or a lotion, and that can certainly be a starting point. Um, People do get irritation with um, using anything topically on your skin, mm -hmm. but it's certainly a starting point. The main thing is to really see your GP and your friendly dermatologist, which will kind of diagnose the condition, because there are 52 other hair conditions. So it's about getting it right.
If you watch the show regularly, you'd know we're all about gut health here in the house. But what happens when your gut gets sick? Gerald, today you're looking at the issue of IBS. For those who don't exactly know, what exactly is it? Aren't we fascinated by the gut, Heinze? And it's, it's an issue not so much associated with the upper part. We're talking here about colon or lower bowel issues. And it's, it's just a disease which is very common. Uh, it's one in five Australians. And um, sadly, women are more affected than men. And it's really the group of symptoms that cause the issues which can develop over a period of time. So gas production, bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhoea, with those latter two often alternating, which can make an enormous difference, Rach, to just how you enjoy your life. Mm. So you're talking about IBS specifically? Mm, irritable bowel syndrome. So yes. it's, a, it's a, a group of symptoms that's not so much a disease, but a group of symptoms. So okay. the gut doesn't actually get damaged, it just manifests all these issues. Because, I mean, I get tummy upsets from time to time. How do I differentiate that from IBS and is there a cure for it? The differentiation is more by looking at the symptoms and you discuss those with your healthcare practitioner and sadly we have no cure Rach. The, the thing we can do though is look at our fibre intake. Australians mm. are notoriously poor intakers of fibre. So green leafy vegetables, uh, plenty of fibre-rich cereals, all those things, pasta, rice, things that we know are good for us. And the big thing we often miss is water. Mm. So eight glasses of water or eight glasses of fluid across the day to help get the benefits of the fibre. Beautiful. So we've spoken about food. What else can we do? I would imagine there are some other lifestyle factors that come into play. We know a lot about now the brain-gut axis. So there's pathways going up and down. So how you feel often is manifested in your gut mm. behaviour and vice versa. So managing stress is really important. And how often do we say that? And the other option is that we look at a probiotic. Mm -hmm. And particularly one called Lactobacillus plantarum. Big name, but it's the one that's got the clinical evidence, Rachel, to make a difference for medically diagnosed IBS. I take a probiotic daily. Good. Um, can I be taking this specific one if I don't have IBS? If you have an inefficient digestive system and you're getting any of those symptoms we talked about, so gas production, bloating, constipation, mm. diarrhoea, you certainly will get benefit from using that particular lactobacillus. Okay, and once again, so wellness really does come down, as you said, it's diet, it's exercise, exercise to relieve the stress and it's finding out what is right for you. Thank you so much, Gerald. And the A to Z of vitamins is brought to you by Swiss, Australia's number one brand of vitamins and supplements. Welcome back to the House of Wellness. Last week we all had our mums on set for Mother's Day. How good was that? So, so much fun. fun. Your beautiful daughter, Willow, of course, yeah. as well. And luckily they're all still in great health. But as we see our parents ageing, we all know the inevitable. And while we all sometimes wish we could live forever, that's not the reality, Jo. No, of course not. But it is really hard to face the reality that our parents won't be around forever. Mm. I mean, we're all getting older and, of course, they may get sick, which is all the more reason to have those hard conversations with our parents while they're able to. Because nothing would be worse than not knowing what their wishes are if they get sick. And then for us to deal with a mountain of responsibility or care arrangements in the middle of all that grief and stress and as well. Worry. Yeah, well. It's funny because I was just having this conversation with my brother literally three days ago because my parents aren't that well and we feel that it is getting to that time that we will need to have those conversations. My brother lives in America. I live in a different um, state, so the care is going to be really difficult. I'm also looking after two young kids. It's a confronting conversation mm. to have. And the thing is, our parents have spent their whole entire life looking after us. Yeah. So... Yeah, it is a discussion that has to be had, though. Often, actually, the discussion is brought up by the parents mm. because the kids have trouble even conceiving of it, really. Like 91-year-old Claire, who's taken the bull by the horns and made sure her kids, grandkids and great-grandkids have peace of mind about the future. <laughs> You couldn't meet a more sprightly 91-year-old than Claire Adams. I'm healthy and it's just luck. I think it doesn't matter what your ideas are, if you're really sick, 
then it makes a big difference. But I'm, I'm not. It just, just happens that I'm not. Claire doesn't take her health for granted at all. The great-grandmother squeezes as much as she can out of every day and has just returned from a trip to Africa with her family. This was when I got to the gorillas. And I thought it was beautiful because she had a baby. Claire appreciates her independence. She still drives and lives in her own home with her very special extended family. I have two great companion pets. That's a dog and a cat, and they're very fond of each other, and I'm very fond of them. I love them. And I think getting out, I think the animals keep you going, getting out and walking. But Claire is also aware that her health may change at any moment, which is why she's made an advanced care plan, which sets out her end-of-life wishes. It seems to be a very natural thing to, to prepare and Hello, Minnie. have everyone included. My mum, here you going? Oh, hi, Chris. <laughs> Copies of Claire's wishes have been given to each of her three children, with her son Chris mm -hmm. acting as medical power of attorney. I think for um, what <laughs> mum would want, I think it was um, an important thing to do. It might not have been something we wanted to think about, but I think for her um, comfort and um, what her uh, wishes, I think it was a good thing to, um, you know, to focus on and, and also um, the questions specifically go through, you know, situations that um, she might be faced with. Chris more than understands why many people put off facing the hard reality of end-of-life decisions. But when it comes to the crunch, doesn't want to be left not knowing what his mum wants. I think because she's well now, I don't find it upsetting. Look, some members of the family might, but I think that um, because she's well now, I think it's a good time to consider it and uh, for both of us and for the rest of the families. Um, if she was unwell, I think that would be a, a lot harder. The catalyst for taking action for Claire and her family was when the adventurous great-grandmother agreed to be the model for an artistic installation of a sick elderly woman being kept alive by medical intervention. The model made us think of what could happen in the future and, and where she may not be um, capable of making a decision for herself. It also made you think about what mum could be like if she was sick and how um, she was basically just being kept alive. The dying lady sculpture was the idea of intensive care specialist Charlie Cork and was displayed in Melbourne's busy South Bank district. So this is a sculpture of a fabulous 91-year-old lady to illustrate somebody on life support at the extreme of life. I think it's quite confronting, but at the same time we need to be confronted to actually have these tricky conversations. My dad suffered with dementia. It's too late when you get that problem. It's got to be discussed earlier. I had to be still for three hours, but I think I went to sleep. It was, it was just great. With that experience, it made me realise that you can be very, very sick and very useless and how it didn't seem to have any point. But because I'm older now, I feel we should be more open about it all because it's going to happen to all of us and get prepared. What an incredibly beautiful lady in every sense of the word. 91 years of age, I can't believe it. And Claire nailed it when she said that talking about it takes the stress out of planning for old age. So that's what we're going to do right now, intensive care specialist Dr Charlie Cork, who you saw on the uh, clip. Charlie, welcome to you. Thank you for having me. Now, Charlie, you were responsible for that incredible art installation where Claire was uh, the artist model. What did you want to achieve by doing that in such a public way? Well, really, exactly as she said, to really get people to think about how far they'd want to go. 
And interestingly, when people look at the sculpture with all of the medical things around it, most people go, I think that's not what I want. Mm. But a few people go, that's very reassuring because <laughs> there's a lot of things there for her. And that's how, we, how we're different. Yeah. And it's very important to understand because what for one person is appropriate for another person is dreadful. Mm. Yes. And we're just realising in medicine that we really have to understand the person. And uh, it's become really important because what we can do and what we should do, I think, are diverging a bit with what we're able to do. And you can't assume, even though it's a family member, what they would want, obviously. Mm. No, it's really hard. So when you say my family and my doctor will know what to do, mm. I have lots of experience and I can honestly say people don't know. It's really about a really having permission to stop. Right. And without that permission, it's really tough. Really, really tough. So Claire was incredibly brave there, I think, in and seeing herself in a situation that I think mm. would be quite confronting. Mm. And when you see that, that was the catalyst for them to have a conversation within their family. You must often see families that have left it too late. I'm afraid there are a lot of people yeah. that leave it too late or too vague. In Claire's situation, right. she's made Chris the medical power of attorney. Mm. Uh, can that role be nominated to multiple people? How should families navigate this? Well, actually, in different states, things are a little bit different. Yep. But fundamentally, certainly in Victoria, you, can, you nominate one person and then you have another person in case that person's not available. OK. But you don't have to do two. And but I think it's... Um, the important thing is about choosing somebody because I think families are often very, very... You know, I don't know about your family, but, you know, a lot of families have a lot of variation. We don't get on well. We have different ways mm. of thinking. Yeah. And so picking one good decision-maker who understands you mm. uh, probably is very helpful. Certainly when I'm asking and when the crunch comes, it's very helpful to have a person that the patient trusts to and, be the spokesman. And Claire is 91. We saw her family set up. What, what age do you think that we should be having these conversations? Well, as far as an advanced care plan is concerned, I've got one. You know, something could happen to me today. Mm. Um, something so could happen to all of us. as early and, as possible. You know, we could all have uh, terrible road accidents. All sorts of bad things can happen. Mm. I think this is something to do at any time. Mm. And you've set up a not-for-profit website to help people navigate these difficult negotiations. What can you tell us? Well, the, the, the My Values website is uh, just a, uh, is a, a website, a free website, that just allows people to look at the issues, to answer some simple questions, and to create a values profile, so about what's important to them, how they think about these issues. And it's been interesting in doing it that a number of people have said, I wouldn't have guessed that I thought like this, but now I look at it, it's really me. And I'm really, mm. I'm really pleased about that because it's clearly doing something for them. Charlie, difficult conversations to have with our uh, elderly parents, but uh, I think uh, important ones at the same time. Thanks for coming and sharing uh, that with us uh, today. And how about Claire? She is the most inspirational. Beautiful. That's how I want to oh. age yeah. and, uh, and look like she does at 91. From looking towards our destiny to aiming for 2020 insight when it comes to future health of our eyes, that and plenty more to come right here on the House of Wellness. Welcome back to the House of Wellness. Today we are focusing on ageing with dignity and maintaining our health as we get older. Now, I've got a very special guest here today, Victor Tabala. Welcome to the Health Counter. We're taking Thanks, it over. Andy. Sorry, yeah. I, Gerald who? Um, now, you are a naturopath, yep. homeopath and herbalist. Is there anything else you don't have on your tool belt? Oh, well, a family of four, uh, keeping very busy. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so no, a lot of my plates, but I'm um, enjoying every little bit of it. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, I'm all about keeping things real. So today we're going to talk about some natural herbs that we can implement into our lifestyle for good health, uh -huh. but in particular, our vision as yep. we get older, okay. but also detoxing and cleansing our liver. Is that right? Oh, absolutely, yes. Well, let's first start with this one. This is a bilberry. It's not a blueberry. They look similar. They this do. is a bilberry. Can you tell me a little bit about more of these guys? Yeah, well, funny enough, you mentioned blueberries. Uh, so, look, bil bilberries and blueberries are actually related. 
So oh. um, from the same genus, so yep. the genus is called Vaccinium, and so that's basically, yeah, so they, they are related. But in regards to bilberry, what I want you to focus on is the colour. Okay. okay. Now, we know that, of course, that's the colour that makes more blueberries. Yeah, blueberries are so, so popular because yeah. they're so rich in antioxidants and dark. And you mentioned antioxidants. So what it is, is that antioxidant is, of course, the colour. Yeah. And it's called anthocyanoside. Okay. So anthocyanoside is the actual colour, but also the main active ingredient in bilberry that gives bilberry its reputation when it wow. comes to when it comes to eye health. Now apart from that we've got the bilberries for eye health. Uh -huh. This here is milk thistle. Milk thistle. Say that quickly. Tell yeah. me about milk thistle and how it helps our liver. Yeah so milk thistle and, and again milk thistle um, its main active ingredient is a substance called a, a flavonolignin called psilobin yeah. and psilobin its main action is to improve liver health by way of its activity in helping to regenerate liver cells. Because we now our liver, um, we do a lot to it. We drink a lot, we yep. eat a lot, we breathe in toxins. And so our liver is under a lot of pressure, daily pressure. So a herb like milk thistle can be quite a useful herb in terms of making sure that our liver is functioning to the best of its capacity. So it sounds like a super herb. How do we take it? So you can take it, or you can take it as is. You can make it into a, uh, into a, a tea. Uh, I mean, it's the seed that we use from the milk thistle. And, uh, but more importantly, you can also take it as a liquid or also a capsule as well so it is available as a supplement. Milk thistle sounds like the wonder herb. It certainly does. It detox it helps with our detoxification with our liver, liver health in general. It's also good as an antioxidant when it comes to free radicals that enter our system as well and also helps with digestive disturbances in our gut. Well I'm all about eating my way to good health. Victor thank you so much for coming in buddy. No worries thank you very much. Yes, thanks, uh, Victor. Thanks, uh, Heinzy, for that. Now, Joe, I want to ask you a question. What is the weirdest thing you've eaten in the pursuit of your own health? Well, I turned to traditional Chinese medicine to get pregnant with my beautiful willow, so that meant that I brewed and drank a herb that could have been pond water. <laughs> oh, honestly, <laughs> I, I don't know. But anyway, yeah. I have got willow to show for it. So <laughs> yes, and, and, and we love willow. She's beautiful. How about you, Joe? No, so over the years, I've learned to really just stay with all the healthy stuff. I don't go down the un unhealthy pathway. Just, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to teach Joe. Glass of red wine, good food each night. Stay with it. Picture of health. Look at Absolutely. you. You were about to have snakes before, obviously. No, 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 no. I didn't. <laughs> Thank you to Gerald. He's got his nose out of joint. I think Victor's just uh, encroached on his health bar, but we'll uh, sort that out for you. Uh, thank yeah, you to Rachel, stay. as always, to Joe Stanley and Heinz. That's all we've got time for this week. If you'd like more information on anything you've seen on the show, go to our website, houseofwellness.com.au. Don't forget to tune into the House of Wellness radio show every Sunday. And as always, thanks to our very good friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next week.